Hello. Uh, welcome, everybody, um, to a session with uh, Paddy Shank and uh, Miram Neelam. So I think we all kind of get that the times, in the, wor in the words of uh, Bob Dylan, the times they are changing. And uh, L&D may not be changing quite as much as it, as it needs to. But clearly, there are changes that need to happen. And uh, Patty and, and Miriam today will take us through those and get you involved in, in thinking about the changes that we need to see taking place. So without further ado, I shall, I shall hand over. Thank you very much. I'm really glad you're with us today because we're talking about, Mer uh, Mir Miriam and I are going to talk about something we're very passionate about, and that's how L&D needs to respond to some of the crises that are happening with job skills. And so at, f at first, we're going to just take you through a little bit about what we're seeing. But then we will have some very actionable tactics that you can use right away um, to make your training have better outcomes. And so we're going to start with, with um, an introduction to both of us. And we're introducing each other. And we haven't told each other what we're going to say. So that should be pretty weird. Um, and the, the last thing is, you may want, if you're in the way back, to come further down. And I won't tell you why yet, but be, there's a reason. <laughs> OK, yeah. You, um, you want to introduce me first, or should I introduce? I'll introduce you first. Yeah, just OK. The weird thing is, is that Miriam and I had not met each other until two days ago. Yesterday? Yesterday. Was it only yesterday? But we have been working together for at least a year. Um, and we couldn't figure out exactly how we came to meet. But I believe, we think, that what happened is, is that Miriam commented on something that I wrote. And what happened is it turned out we had very similar interests. Um, Miriam has a long history as a learning designer, but what's really interesting is before that, she was a speech therapist. And as a speech therapist, she understands a lot about how we learn, how we read. A lot of what we do in learning is text-based or starts as text. Um, and so she had a natural interest in what makes learning better. Um, one of the best things I, I love about Miriam is that like me, she loves sweets. And like, like me, she is very direct. So when we're on the phone with each other and we don't, or on Skype, and we don't like something that someone else, that she said, or she doesn't like what I said, she just says, yeah, I don't like that. Love that matter. So um, she's definitely one of the rising stars in this community. And I'm really glad to have her here with me for many, many reasons. Thank you, Patty. Is my, yeah. Uh, so this is Patty Shank, but I guess everybody knows. Um, Patty does a lot of different things. Um, she's a learning consultant. She does things like performance and needs analysis with her clients, and she helps people to become better learning designers. She does surveys. She does a lot of research, and I think that that's her core quality, that everything she does is, is research-based. Okay. Uh, for example, she just won, like, uh, Will Talheimer's um, Neon Elephant Award 2017 for her research to practice books, uh, organize and write for deeper learning, and practice and feedback for deeper learning. So um, she's, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that she's kind of like the Oprah Winfrey of the <laughs> learning professionals. <laughs> so we're going to do the... Look under your seat events. <laughs> so look under your seats and see if there's something there. If you, f if you find something under your seat, would you raise it up, please, so others know what you're looking for? <laughs> that wasn't it. Oh, uh, you're so lucky, an empty cup. We got one. <laughs> there's four of them. Where's the others? Yeah. Those are, I have four copies of my books. We've got two, three. There should be, oh, four. Yeah, Got yeah, it. That's great. We're good. So there's four people that can now, um, you know, read Patty's. Did you have Patty's book already? Anybody who? Okay, so that's great. So why I love to work with Patty is because she's uh, smart and funny. And uh, it's also at times very frustrating to work <laughs> with her because she disagrees with me a lot. <laughs> 
of course she's wrong, but um, <laughs> no, but but seriously, like I learned a lot from her, and I just uh, I just hope that we we continue. Uh, she told me I'm not allowed to get any older because <laughs> then we can't work together as long. Yeah, so Patty, uh, take it away. Oh, that's awesome. so the reason we're doing this is that things are changing in the world. You've heard about that in other presentations, correct? There are, there are massive changes going on in organizations. One of the most important changes is that organizational longevity has precipitously dropped. And it's due, in large part, to an inability to keep up with all the changes that are happening. So we depend on evidence-based or research-driven practices that tell us where can we get our best bang for our buck. And so the bottom line here is better outcomes. So we're going to start at a very high level view, but we are going to get very specific about things you can do, four specific tactics you can use. There's hundreds of them, but we picked out four that anyone can use tomorrow. We also want you to know that this presentation is completely based on research on what is happening in the job world. And so here are some of the papers that we used to figure out what are the changes in organizations, what are the changes in job skills, what are people seeing, and these are from around the world. If you're going to pick one of these to read, start with the future of jobs, that one. Um, that will give you the big picture, and at the end of our slides, we'll be giving you the links. You'll have access to our slides, so you'll have access to the links. But jobs are radically changing, and you and I have to change with them, because our organizations are not keeping up um, if they cannot adapt rap rapidly. And rapid adaptability has become just so incredibly important. You and I can probably think of five or six organizations that were in business for hundreds of years and are now gone. Um, one of them is a bookstore that, that was near my home. And we, one of the reasons we loved living where we were is, is the bookstore, um, Borders Books, and gone, couldn't keep up. Um, so that's what, that's what we're talking about. So we're going to be talking about three things. Accelerating global change, that's changing what organizations need to do to survive. How that's changing job skills, including yours and mine. And the need for quicker and better outcomes. So we'll start with accelerating global change. So I said before that corporate longevity is at an all-time low. And that's a problem because there's things they can do in order to adapt to these changes. So what am I talking about here? Well, I'm going to talk about what kinds of changes we're talking about. And here's three of them. One is just radical technology change in short periods of time. The other one is demographic shifts, such as um, women in the workplace, younger people having much more money. Um, and so that changes who you and I need to be responsible to. It's, all organizations have customers. And if they're not responsible, they go out of business. And shifts in, in global power. Um, globalization of jobs has changed everything. Um, and there are things we need to do to keep up with that. So the first, we're not going to spend a lot of time on that, but if you read the, the WEF report, you will see exactly the kinds of changes. They, they categorize them, they discuss in, in detail what those changes are happening and, and what that means for jobs. The, I'll give you a bottom line, is we're not keeping up, and I'll show that to you in just a moment. So here, here's what I'm talking about. A manpower research study of 42,000 employers asked about shortages in job skills. 
And here's what they found over the course of 2006 to 2016. At this point, employers are saying that there are talent shortages that are keeping them from surviving. What's interesting, though, is rather than just saying, well, there's not, that pipeline is not giving us the talent we need. What they are now saying is, we need our L&D departments to be our pipeline. That means radical change for what you and I are doing. We need to know where that business is going, what skills are needed to support it, and we need to help those skills uh, happen in the workplace. So one, one of the issues is, is that the jobs themselves are changing. And so we've got three categories. We've got jobs that are gone, left, declining. Can somebody give me an example of a job in, in their industry that is gone or is leaving? Typesetter? Yeah, that, may, that makes total sense. And how about jobs that are now here that didn't even exist five or 10 years ago? Anyone have an example in, in their organization of a job that's pretty new? Blogger, Blogger. right. Um, that word didn't even exist 10 years ago, or maybe it did, but it was just starting. So, and, and other jobs that are undergoing huge changes in the skills required to get that job done. Anybody? How about raising your own hand? Has your job changed radically in, in the last five years to what you need to do? So we're gonna give you some examples. These are jobs that, and I got this from the research as well, the research that I showed you earlier. Here are jobs that are gone or in heavy decline. Here are jobs that didn't exist 10 years ago, but exist now. The blogger is on there. What? The blogger is on there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And jobs undergoing large changes. Can somebody tell me why those jobs are undergoing changes? What's, what's changing in all those jobs? Using technology, right. There's almost no job existing now that doesn't use technology. I'll give you a for instance. Um, electricians, car mechanics, those folks are now all using technology because the technology is part of, of what they're doing. Car mechanics deal with computers constantly. Um, electricians putting in a thermostat now have to deal with programming. Um, everything has changed, and that means what we're doing is changing as well. So I said earlier that, that jobs are changing. I want to explain some things that are happening in the world of jobs, according to the research, that impact what you and I do. Many years ago, job skills were fairly stable. You learned your job skills, you got better at them or not, but they didn't radically change. Didn't, someone didn't come up to you on a Tuesday morning and says, I need you to learn the XYZ software by Thursday afternoon. Is that a common thing these days? Where people say, I need you to know something that you didn't know or know how to do it, and you have to do it yourself? Um, can you think of instances in your own jobs or in other people's jobs in your industry where, where they have to learn all the time? Example? I'm patient. <laughs> Actually, I'm not, but yes. We have engineers that do things. They have to read the book in the helicopter going out. Right, reading the book in the helicopter. We'll show you an example of that in a moment. Um, but it's actually different. But yes, absolutely. I am seeing, I am seeing um, flight crew carrying now iPads. Um, so that they can have the most up-to-date version of whatever they need. Um, and someone's got to create that. They've got to be willing and able to learn on, on a dime. So here's what's going on today. 
skill sets are much more complex than they used to be. What's happening with jobs that are not complex? They're being automated, wholesale. Um, and so the skills that people have in jobs are much more complex than they used to be. They're, people are needing to learn new and changing skills. And I've got some, defi not definitions, but some terms here that Miriam will be talking about. And here's the big one for you and me. And it's what we're going to spend the rest of the time on. How do we train people, support people in learning under the climate of reduced time to proficiency? People do not have time to take months or years to learn a skill and get better at it. It has a lot of implications for what you and I do. So, so right now I'm going to hand it over to Miriam, and she's going to take you through some exercises on thinking through L&D's response. Thank you. Yeah. So. Here on this slide, there's the four changes listed that Patty has just discussed. What I would like to do is divide the room in four. So it's a bit, well, doesn't really matter. One, two, three, four. So just figure it out. <laughs> um, I suggest that group one deals with change one, so rapidly uh, changing business uh, needs and priorities. You guys are number two, which is about the complex skills. You guys are number three, which is about the new and changing skills, and then the re reduced time to proficiency is for you. What I would like you to do is take about three minutes to discuss with your neighbor or ponder yourself what we can do as learning professionals to help people and organizations adapt to those changes. And then, you know, when time's up, we're going to ask you to share some of your thoughts. So... We're giving you three minutes. Three minutes. Go. Go. Okay. Thank you. Anybody who wants to share... Yeah, let's start with change number one, the rapidly changing business needs and priorities. Anybody wants to share? Um, well, I think we need to be moving much more towards curating content. Curating content. So that we can quickly adapt and... And, and get people what they need. Yeah. yeah. Hi, it's Andrew Lash from Philips. I actually think we need to get a table. Ah. Yeah, so broaden our perspective, make sure we get a seat at the table, uh, speak business language. No, and understand what it means. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, that's super. What about the second one, the more complex skills? Yeah, we had kind of a discussion in this area. At least my view and a couple of us, we don't think that the skills are more complex. Actually, I think they are simpler, but it's the amount kind of a couple of examples. Uh, you know, they were talking about program language are way easier these days, not more complex. Expense reports, we all travel, and before you need to know your cost center, your account, all that is being automated. So the skills themselves that you need, they are simpler, but the amount of things that you need to learn is what it makes. Okay. So, well. so how, do we, how do we support that? Absolutely, that's great. <laughs> Super, yeah, that's good. Anybody else? The new and changing skills. Yes, please. Okay. 
so as an, a learning professional, you are responsible for understanding the context and explaining to the, in that case, learner as you know, any, as in a worker, to like what's in it for me? Why do I need this? Why is this relevant for my job? That's a really good point. Yes. They do not. Exactly. So again, so that's slightly different to what the gentleman said over there, but it's again to have that broader view of how things change and what that means for the business and how learning fits in, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. Like, to, so to help the business actually to advise them, yeah, so to become trusted advisors around a wide variety of skills. Because a lady was saying that, you know, businesses might feel more comfortable with technical skills, but there are many other skills that are, you know, as critical or sometimes even more critical in certain contexts. The uh, reduced time to proficiency. Yeah, so you need, to, as, a, as a professional, to be at the same level as your client and, and preferably even beyond. So you have to have access to the newest stuff, like at all times. Anybody else? Okay, so taking advantage of, of peers and other groups around you and try to leverage each other's strengths also, and also learn, learn from mistakes. Yeah, super. All great examples. Can yeah. I do one for number four? Yes. So th that's something we come up against a great deal where put, putting together a really good kind of training or performance um, support in place takes, takes a lot of time. But I think this idea of life in perpetual beta is yeah. really... Um, could you turn, me up, turn my mic up, please? Yeah. Am I up? Yeah, so this idea of um, you know, a minimum viable product, yes. life in perpetual beta. So don't launch the thing when it's 100% perfect. Nothing's ever perfect because it's being launched into a changing And by that time, it's changed. It's obsolete, right. exactly. So launch something which is good enough that you do in a fraction of the time and maybe gets you 70 or 80% of the way there and then iterate it and actually evaluate over it. Time, right, over time, right, by use. Exactly. And mm -hmm. if it's effective, stop there. Save yourself a load of money. Spend that budget elsewhere. Yeah. Good point. I think just on that point right there, it's, uh, what you work with is maybe it's more coaching and trying to get those teams that are looking at doing that iterative approach, mm. letting them recognize how they actually may need to work to get to work. Because we don't have such a fast paced world. Yeah, yeah. Right. If we can let them recognize how they made those mistakes and how right. improve on that, that is the best case way to us. Yeah. Your users know best. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, can you, can you repeat it? Because... Um, yes, so the, the gentleman was just saying to, to get the users involved in, um, you know, the audience involved in putting together the solution, yes. so they take more ownership of it, and absolutely, they, they always, almost always know the best way to solve their own problems. It's just a case of facilitating that with them. Thank you. So all great uh, ideas, um, you know, from all of you around those, those four changes. Um, what I would like to do now is share what Patty and I think are the key things we should be doing as, as learning professionals. And of course, you know, we're only going to focus on a few because of time, and you have all contributed you know, greatly because, of course, there are many other things that we can do. Um, the three that we uh, focus on, um, Patty and I are convinced that these are really important ones to help 
people deal with those changes and to help organizations survive and you know, get to quicker and, and better outcomes. So these are the three things that we think we should be doing. We think we should use proven training strategies and tactics to get to faster and better outcomes. We think we should help people to build transferable, durable, flexible skills. And the last one is we should teach people to become better self-directed learners. Confession, who thinks training is that not the one thing that we should no longer be doing as L&D? Who thinks that? Training should be out. Training should be gone. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, Patty and I are convinced that training, you know, we still need training. We need training to help people learn those new skills, to help them understand how they can best adapt to those changing skills. However, we should not be doing it the way we have been doing it, as in training as an event. Training should never be an event. We almost always learn sequentially, and we always need to practice to gain proficiency. So training needs to, it, it needs to be about a specific purpose, and training needs to be designed to achieve that purpose. We know from research that training done well is a critical factor um, in tackling those challenges that Patty has, has just discussed. And I'm saying a, you know, a solution, a critical solution, because of course we need to do many other things. You know, you, the, all the things you mentioned just now, we need to do as well. Um, but. Yes, and, and also, you know, we acknowledge that the business needs should always be at the core, and we need to figure out if there is a performance problem at all, and if there is a performance problem, we need to make sure that, you know, training is the best way to go about it. But the point is that if training is designed well, using what we know from research, and not just tra training and learning research, but other researchers as well, what we know works well, then, it supports learning, and then learning supports performance. So that's where we're coming from. This is our suggestion. Let's start by using what we know from sciences. All these sciences, like at the top of the funnel, not just learning and training research, but other sciences as well, UX, social, cognitive, all these sciences. Let's use what we know from research all these sciences give us hooks for effective learning design. Um, you know, they give us an opportunity to provide evidence-based strategies and tactics to get to those, so, you know, so important outcomes. Efficient and effective performance results. That's what it's all about, right? So I would like to talk about two specific proven training strategies today. First one is um, to help people build durable, flexible, and transferable skills. And what we mean by that is skills durability is that people are able to use a skill over long periods of time. Skill transferability means that they are able to use what they've learned. And skill flexibility means that you know, they're able to use it in various contexts uh, and situations. The other one is self-direction. Patty will talk about that later. I'll start with the um, durable, flexible, and transferable skills one. The first tactic is have training mirror the job context. This is an example. Let's say you need to learn Google Analytics to do your job. What Google does, it provides you with an opportunity to practice with Google Analytics by, you can open up a demo account, they give you access to authentic uh, Google merchandise store, I think it's called, data so that you can practice with authentic client data, you can, you know, 
set up your own use case, uh, try to, you know, you can just learn by doing. The other thing that's really good about it is that they also ask you questions so you can check your understanding. And why this is so important is because when you learn by doing, you might start to do stuff based on misconceptions or misunderstandings. So these questions help you to check if, if you interpret what you're doing the right way, and it helps you understand what happens in the back end as well. So it's a really strong example of you know, mirroring the job context. It might be worth just pointing out that the, the questions on the right here, which are too small for you to see, they're, yeah. not, they're not testing uh, recollection of facts. They're, they're testing the user's ability to interpret the simulation that they're using. So they're asking things like, uh, under the audience in the mobile uh, overview report, what percentage of sessions came from mobile devices? So by that, you need to have a level of understanding of the simulation and to, to find, be able to find where that information is. Thank you. So why mirroring the job context is so important is because research shows that it helps transfer and long-term remembering. Next tactic, remembering is important. A lot of people think that we don't need to remember that much anymore because you know, we have access to the web, we can look everything up. So um, we're saying that remembering is still uh, super important and we're saying that looking things up won't get us very far. <laughs> Okay, now let's see. You want to pull your tooth out? Uh, P, P, P U, P U L, P U L L. Pull tooth. T, T, P U O, P U O, P O P O T H. Here we are. Pull your tooth out. Boy, this is gonna hurt. Doctor, if it's gonna hurt, please give me something to kill the pain. Yeah. Okay. Well. Got some Novocaine right here. Just uh, hold on that now. Let's see how this works here. Okay, Novocaine. Here we are. Novocaine. Take a firm hold of the hypodermic needle. Right. <laughs> ah. Ah. There'll be a little bit of pain, and then numbness will set in. <laughs> Okay, well, I think you get the point. Like, looking things up will only get us so far. Like, if you need to perform, like, in your role, you need at least a certain amount of knowledge in your head to be able to just perform. Um, the other reason why it's so important to remember things is because it makes learning easier. You build knowledge on top of other knowledge, and so you increase your knowledge incrementally over time. Um, another reason is that you need factual knowledge in your head to be able to solve complex problems and it also influences your reasoning capability. So it's about, you know, if you look at the research uh, about expertise, and a lot of people are not aware of this, but what expertise research shows clearly is that factual knowledge is required to solve complex problems because people without the knowledge are not able to recognize certain patterns that experts are able to recognize, you know, like that. So you just overlook a lot of stuff when you, when you don't, you know, you have, when you look stuff up, you have to like interpret what you see and well, if you have it in your head and you build proficiency over time, you're just able to get like so much further. This is another example. This is Jane's prescription, and she brings it to the optician, um, you know, to get it filled. And she also has already picked her favorite frame with it, and she's asking the optician to, uh, you know, to get her glasses uh, ready for her. I would like to ask you the following two questions. What do you think the optician needs to know to handle Jane's request? And what do you think she can look up? And I know probably nobody in the audience is you know, an expert or is an optician, neither am I. Patty is a little bit, she has a history um, 
uh, she works as an optician. But that's not the point. So, I mean, I, I understand that you're not able to come up with very specific examples, but just try to think from a higher level, like with this type of job, what are things you need to know and what are things that are okay to look up. So we're gonna do this a little bit differently. Does everybody have like paper and at hand or a piece of, just a piece of paper and, and whatever, a pen or, or, or a pencil? Or just ask your neighbor. But what I would like to ask you is, if you, if you have ideas for question one, just jot down a one on a piece of paper and, and give us your idea. And if you wanna answer question two, just write down question two, just number two, and, and give an idea. The idea is that we can just collect some ideas and then you know, can discuss it again um, after. So I'll give you three minutes again, and we just pass it on to the front. Uh, maybe Rob can be so kind. Sorry, I'm collecting <laughs> you, we'll, did, we'll, you did tell us you wanted yeah, to do jumping jacks. Yeah, we'll, we'll be grading it as well. And um, <laughs> if we are grading it, there should be a prize, I guess. So you've already given out all the books. Uh, yeah. I have. There's no prize. The, yeah. the prize is getting, the getting prize good is you answers. Get, you get lunch with Patty and Miriam. There you go. <laughs> Best answer. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, time starts now. Great. So we've got a you few got coming one? in now. Brilliant. Okay. There's one, there's we one got here, one. the gentleman here. Oh, the lady here. Brilliant. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, this so is much. great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Help from the audience. Very thank much you. appreciated. We've got a few more just coming in. Okay. We'll wait. What the members mean? How to order? Another lady. Oh, perfect. I'm starting with that one. <laughs> Thank you. Ah, you're all so good. Ah, brilliant. Super. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm more. <gasps> wow. Ah, very creative okay. as well. That's. Kind of. Okay, cool. I think, yeah. So, We're ready? Uh, I'm going to give this to Patty because I have no clue. <laughs> I came up with this example because, because when I was in my 20s, late 20s, um, I had, like many people, a bachelor's degree in pretty much nothing. It was economics. I'm good with math. Um, but there are no jobs, for, for specific jobs, for people with a bachelor's of economics. Um, so I went to school for a year. I was going through a, a divorce, and I needed to be able to support myself and my, my daughter. So. Um, I went to school for a year and got a certificate um, uh, and became a certified optician, a job which I adored. Um, and so I picked this for a number of reasons. And, and um, let me find some of the answers here that, that I would have picked at knowing this. Um, will the frame handle the, the actual prescription? Very good. Who got that who, one? Who was that? Who got, That's who was that? It was, it, so do you know about optics? And, and, yeah. yeah. Oh. I mean, if you wear if you wear glasses, you know something. But other people said some. So, and I'll come back to that in a minute. What do these terms mean? Um, and they have very specific physics meanings. Um, so to be an optician, you need to understand physics um, as it uh, as it applies to different types of lenses. Um, and how those lenses handle things like astigmatism, um, distance and near. Um, so that ad right there it means that, that somebody's older. Um, and the problem with this frame is that, that anybody here wear, wear progressive lenses? Certain lenses, uh, certain frames will handle progressive lenses. And if you go online, you can buy glasses online now. I don't recommend it. but but. You have to understand, it'll say handles progressives. Um, and that means there's room for the change in prescription from distance to near and in between, which is for most of us computer glasses. Um, so, so those terms have something to do with that. And axis is where the astigmatism is. So if you're also grinding lenses, which I did back then, you have to understand where to put in that aberration for, for astigmatism. Um, and you need to understand lens materials and how they, how they are better for one audience or another. In, in my day, if someone came in with a child, you only gave them, we had glass lenses back then as well. I don't see them much anymore, but, and they were heavy. 
Um, but, but we used polycarbonate because they didn't shatter in sports. Um, and if you dropped them, they didn't shatter. They might scratch, but not shatter. So there's a, there's a bunch here. Let me find a few other. So this is still around the... Uh, what do you what need, do to, you know? need to know? Right, and uh, let me look up some of the two. Look up reference values and procedures. True, absolutely. Although most of them, I ran a store by myself for two years before they gave me someone else. There was always three or four people waiting. Ha and think of jobs in your own industry and where you work, where like if you're at the front desk of a hotel, do you need to know where everything is in that hotel? You do. Um, you might be able to look it up during times when you're not busy, but, but there are things that if someone said to you, um, can I do this here, you would need to know something about that, that room, that, that facility, yeah. Having the prescription, I mean, basically all this information that we have here today, you go online and the systems will check automatically the frame that you choose goes with the prescription and everything. So why it, do you need to know all that? You need to know it because everybody's got, got something, or not everybody, but a fair number of the people who come in. Um, when you, that's why I said I do not recommend buy, buying glasses online. If you have a very simple prescription, by the way, this is not simple. Um, and I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time explaining why. It just isn't. So this frame will not work for this prescription. The lenses here are thick, and they're going to stick out a, of a metal frame. Um, will she care? I need to talk to her about that. Um, she online very much might pick this, and they might send it to her. And how many people have spent a bunch of money on a pair of glasses? Right. They're expensive. Um, do you know what, which particular lens materials are going to be best for your, there are hundreds of lens materials now. Um, they're going to give you options. And you say, well, I don't need to pay for that. Well, I don't want photochromic. And another point is as well, even if computers would be able to learn all that stuff, right? Because that's probably going to be possible like quite quickly. Then still, you need to have, like you can't fully trust on a, a, the computer, you know, working with people because as Patty said, they might have a certain type of disease that, you know, I mean, yes, you can put certain things in, but but there's, there might be just... There's de complex decisions Okay, let's going say on. That, that the computer ma makes a decision based on all the data that it has, and it's the correct data, but this, the glasses come back, and, and the person says, it's, it's not right. So then you still need your expertise to be able to figure out, because that's where we're going to the complex problem solving. This is a complex problem, because the computer had all the correct data, it's, it's not but, working but for it, this But person. it didn't know everything. Like, for instance, I know when I go in to get glasses, I have to tell them, this isn't on here, the term PD, pupillary distance, it's the distance between the center of your eyes where the light goes in. Um, I have chronic migraine. I can, if, that, if that pupillary distance is off by one millimeter, I'll be throwing up in your shop. I, I can't, I, my, my brain cannot handle it. That's a, great, that's a great picture, isn't it? Um, but, but there are things, this, isn't, this is just this example. Every job has these examples where if you don't deal with a variety of factors at the same time, and AI can do a lot of that, but it's not available for this particular skill yet. Although if you go into, have you gone into a doctor's office and seen, seen, they can tell what your prescription is really fast using a machine. But a human being is doing that first or second, A or B, um, because, because they have to get further than that. And there's a lot of skill involved. Yeah, so the main point is that this is what we as learning professionals need to be able to do. We need to be able to figure out, you know, what is okay for people to look up and what are the things they need to remember. And we need to provide them with the correct support to help them remember stuff they need to remember over time. That was a bit loud. <laughs> 
So my next question is, do you know what the most fundamental thing is that we can do to help people with their long-term remembering? No one? Yeah, repetition. Yeah. Repeat, I hear. Yes, repeat is, 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 is partly correct. It's spacing. So spacing is a little more, it is repetition, but it's not just repetition. It is repetition spread over time. So, and it's also not repetition as in, I show a video explaining a concept here, and I'm going to repeat that video in two weeks, and I'm gonna repeat the same video in three months. So it's, let's say it's, a, it's about a concept. Let's say it's about for the optician and it's about terminology. Then I can actually just move on to that, that, that example. So what, what spacing means in a context like this, where people need to learn a lot of terminology and they need to remember it over long periods of time, then you need to offer it let them practice with it in different ways. So yes, you might have a video explaining a certain term. They might have you know, a glossary where they can look up and you know, repeat for themselves over time. You might give them a use case with certain terminology and have them practice in how to apply. So long story short, you need to tweak the way, uh, you need to vary the conditions um, or, you know, you, you need to make sure that they are able to apply it in a flexible manner, and that's how people learn. That's how your memory traces become stronger. It's probably worth just making the point as well. There's some uh, platforms and apps that I've come across that claim there is an algorithm for this. We use very clever maths algorithms so that people get the right things at the right points. And I've uh, looked at that too, and... Yeah. and there isn't. <laughs> I, I'm not convinced that anybody knows the exact thing. Yeah, but yeah. It, but, it depends on the context. But Miriam, it really depends that. on the context. Yeah. That's yeah. key. So the research shows subtleties in you know what's the best way of of doing uh, space practice. Um, sometimes it shows that longer periods are better. So there are certain subtleties, but. What's critical for us to remember at this point and that we need to start doing is that we need to start applying, using, providing opportunities for spaced repetitions, spaced practice over time. So that's one thing we, would do, we should do. And the other thing that we should do is what I was just explaining. We need to make sure that those repetition, the repetitions vary slightly you know, giving them all kinds of different contexts um, so that they get this, you know, stronger memory trace and are able to remember and apply in, in all those contexts that, they are, that they're in, like different clients, different, I don't know, a lot of different things. So this is what I wanted to tell you about uh, the, the building durable, flexible, and transferable skills. And Patty is now going to move on to the next strategy that we wanted to focus on, which is self-directed learning. Any questions about what we've talked about so far? We forgot to tell you at the very beginning that we don't want you to hold your questions. Just <laughs> throw them at us. A anything so far? What people should know and what they shouldn't know and how they know, and LMD's responsibility. It strikes me, is it also LMD's responsibility to train people to be comfortable with the grey? Because it's these grey areas yeah. where we struggle now, isn't it? So I was yeah. interested in your opinion on that. Um, I think that falls under something we're not discussing implicitly, which, it, which is being able to, how to learn, how, how to relearn, how to add learning, how to check your understanding. I'm going to talk a little bit about this now, and let me know if this is on the right target. Uh, one of the things we know is that you and I cannot train everybody in everything that's changing in their jobs. Miriam said we need to understand their jobs, 
And this is something the two of us could not agree more on, that we cannot train people. And the research is so very clear on this. There is a wide variety of outcomes that ha can happen. The best outcomes is if what we're doing is completely relevant to what they're doing and what they already know. Um, there's all kinds of terminology here that, that Miriam and I use because it comes from the research, but that's the bottom line. Content alone is nothing. Um, we, have to, we have to use what we know. Content, let me put it this way. Content may be necessary, but is wholly insufficient. We need to help people understand how to learn. We need to teach them if the things we do train on have to be done in ways that, that make outcomes much better. Um, because we simply need to do more, and we can't do it poorly. Um, so, so what I'm going to talk about next is self-direction. And, and self-direction is just a critical skill for people who are constantly learning new jobs. And I think that's sort of where, where you are going. So the, the first strategy is helping people plan, monitor, and evaluate their own learning. Why don't we do this naturally? Well, we don't do it naturally because we're trained not to. How many people get to pick what they need to learn, how to learn it, and, and figure out if they did it well? In, in um, schooling, higher ed, we're, we're taught what to learn, how to learn. And so by the time we get to adults, we think we don't know that it's our, many people don't know that, that it's their own responsibility to understand. So this is something we need to embed in everything we do, teach people how to do this. So here's an example. Let's say we're doing an actual training session. We have a planning part where people need to fit, because every person in the room needs something slightly different based on their jobs, or may need slightly different. So we're going to help them figure out what is it that you need to be able to do? What is your specific goal, and how will you know if you've met it? And while we're training, we also, we also stop at points and say things like, how's your plan going? Are you on track? You're not? What's going wrong? What are you going to do? Make it so that people start thinking about what it is they have to do in order to get where they want to go. Have you ever done a training session and people ask you questions about 15 things that you weren't covering? Whose responsibility is that? I would say, and I do say when, I, when I'm training people, that, that um, when they say, we're not going to cover that here, I can tell that's important to you. Here's what, and I may have a slide, a hidden slide, or available just to say, how, how are you going to get that information? Is there anybody in the audience who can help? Um, I, I'm not responsible for everything. I can't be as a trainer. Um, so, and as an L&D person with a wider mission, I need to help people get to this point. I'll give you an example. Here's an example of an application for doctors and nurses to plan their learning for certification. Um, doctors and nurses have to recertify. And they, they, it's difficult. It's a large task. And so there's an application out that just helps them plan, monitor, and evaluate their own learning. Likewise, this is just my own idea. We could. Do, this is an app that I built in my mind um, about I want to learn how to use a specific tool for data analysis, for example. Um, what are my plans? How am I going to get there? When am I going to evaluate how I'm doing? Um, this, these are skills that make people self-directed. And the, the other tactic, the last tactic, we talked about it earlier. Miriam talked about it. It's changing from learning events to learning over time as a process. And to help people use that, that plan, monitor, evaluate over time themselves as adults. They are adult learners. We can't do it all for them. And if you need to learn something by Friday, chances are 
you're not going to be giving a course on it, but they may be able to find courses online. They may be able to find resources and to help people. And someone said curating earlier, um, to help curate. If you don't know the job, you can't do this, but curate resources for people who are learning. Let's say you're an IT trainer, and, and people are learning um, how to connect um, one, one system to another that they didn't have to do before, but we can, we can provide resources and help them with that. Here's an example of that. Cisco Systems, the networking people, have a path for, for networking expertise. And the reason I know about this is my son's an IT person, and he's on this path. But the path isn't just learning content. It's not just training events. It's a series of training events with practice events, certification practice, uh, mentoring, help, all that sort of thing. So here's my, here's my own thought about how that might look for, let's say we have supervisors who need to increase their skills in finan financial expertise. And so just help them come up with their list of goals, curate readings, have them curate for each other. If there's 10 or 15 that are all doing the same thing, um, have them help each other. And so here's a plan for learning over time, for self-paced learning. Um, and again, because you and I can't do this all ourselves, um, we have to help people get there. Yes. Yeah. You want to talk to this one? Sure. <laughs> so, yeah, so we have just explained, you know, all the things that, that we think we should start doing um, more of and that we think are key for, for those global changes, accelerating changes, and the changes in jobs and skills that come with that. So just to wrap it up, we would like to just, you know, get your ideas on, you know, what, what do you feel can you use, what can you start doing tomorrow, or what are you already doing um, around you know, the durable, flexible, and transferable skills, but also the self-directed learning? So here we have the four tactics. How, can somebody give me an example of how you would use one of those tactics? Or are already using it. Yes. Yes. Or I'm finding it very difficult to use that, because hmm. I work in a highly regulated We are beholden to regulators. Regulators are in, or, and interested in performance and non-conformance. And so all on? our training is built around that. Is it not right? I'll talk more loudly. <laughs> <laughs> Or less likely, if you like. Uh, he, he's saying he works in a regulated industry, and he, he has a hard time sometimes because their outcomes and the outcomes from learning and training may be different. Well, it, it's because it's very specific and very regulated, and you, you are obliged to do it. All, all of the training is mandatory. There is no, no, no self-direction in the learning. You might want to increase your knowledge to encompass other things for which you are not specifically responsible, but things in which you are interested for future career progression. But most of it is about spending enough time doing the thing that you need to do to use an autoclave oven. Right, absolutely. So, uh, Matt, so one of the things in that case that might be important for you and you're probably doing is making sure that people spend the time so that they become proficient enough. And that's, in many cases, and, and Miriam and I talk about this regularly, is like, is that L&D's role to make sure people get the practice to get expertise? Because in a lot of jobs, they don't have time for that. They just move on. Um, and we would both say it certainly is to get to, to, a, to improve faster learning to get to a certain level of well, expertise. In combination with that self-directed learning, because in the end you want, you know, currently there is a big misconception that everybody is a, is a good self-directed learner. That's not the case. The people are good self-directed learners, are high-performing people. Yes. So you need to increase that proficiency level first, but in parallel you need to teach them how to become better self-directed learners. And I think in your... Um, area, there's another challenge, which is that it's not always, in my experience, the case that they really 
help people to apply it and help them remember it, it's often a tick the box exercise as well. Yeah. Like, okay, everybody has completed the, the training, we're good. And we're, we're and done. And that's not fair to the people in the way that they need that practice to, to, you know, to make it stick. And, and one example, uh, and I've done this for a couple of clients, is where, where we actually built practice schedules with the supervisors um, and, and put them into play so that, because it's not the first thing a supervisor is going to think of. Um, but when it pops up on Outlook, um, these three people are coming due for, for their six month check on this. Um, so to make that happen. Anybody else have an example of where they might use one of these tactics? The lady up there at the back. Just there to the right. Okay, yay. <laughs> technique um, that's not used very often anymore, to my knowledge, is action learning, action learning sets. Mm -hmm. um, but in my experience, where they are used and people can commit to them, um, it, it's really, really effective. I, I think part of what you're talking about is actually, and we've talked about it, making it more like the job, make, having more practice, helping people get to a level of proficiency. The research show, shows that most people, by the time they're done with training, have no proficiency or very little. And the, while that might sound bad, that's where new people start. Um, so how do we get them out of the classroom to keep going? And that's the kinds of things we're talking about. So that, that makes sense. So we're going to wrap it up and then take a couple questions if you've got them. Um, we promised you before that we were going to give you some resources, and these slides will be available. Here's, Miriam and I are very, very passionate about making better outcomes from learning and development, especially since these are the outcomes that help organizations survive long term. Um, and so these are, th fr from Miriam and I, things that we do, including the two books that I've written. Um, and then here's all of the references we used on the nature of changes in jobs, um, changing t changes in the world that are changing the workplace, and lack of skills in certain areas that are causing, especially IT skills. Um, some organizations are, have gone out of business, um, and you can read that because they simply didn't have the skills they needed. So any other questions for, for the two of us as we wrap up? You know, or, or you can also find Miriam or, or Patty in the, in the lunch break as well, of course. Please try to start applying it if you're not already doing it. We've got, we've got hundreds ask. of them for you, but we started with ones that are very widely applicable and very easy to apply. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, everybody. Patty and Miriam. <laughs>